people obviously right on cue. They will be coming in. Hello, everybody. Welcome back or welcome to day three of our week-long event for our series of Let's Talk Fox Valley Caring Conversations honoring National Healthcare Decisions Day. I'm seeing a lot of familiar faces again, which is really good to see. So hello and welcome. Uh, what Let's Talk Fox Valley is, just a quick review. Um, it's a community movement to improve end-of-life care and encourage advanced care planning conversations and planning. Um, what is National Healthcare Decisions Day? It is coming up Friday, April 16th, traditionally the day after tax day, as we can all know and remember now, it's as there's nothing more certain in life than death and taxes. Uh, National Healthcare Decisions Day is a nationwide initiative to encourage people to, of all ages to encourage um, people to share their personal wishes regarding their future medical care, health care, um, teams and facilities and healthcare community to respect those wishes, whatever they may be. So as we introduce our speaker today, she is the Senior Director of Cancer Control Strategic Partnerships at the American Cancer Society. She has spent time at the American Cancer Society, Theta Care as an Outreach Coordinator, the Alzheimer's Association as an Executive Director of the Greater Wisconsin Chapter, amongst other various jobs. Uh, she is currently at the American Cancer Society, as I just said, as of February of 2020. And as a senior manager of health systems, she was responsible for leading cancer control efforts in Wisconsin and implementing evidence-based strategies to reduce cancer incidence and decreasing mortality rates. As senior director, she is currently responsible for leading her region team in the achievement of cancer, cancer control goals through comprehensive partnership with prioritized health systems with some of her skills specializing in aging and long-term care. And as we stated with questions for her as she goes through her presentation, uh, if you could direct message myself, Josh Nelson or Ellen Kosky and we'll get them to her. And without further ado, I'm happy to present Kim Kenner of the American Cancer Society. Kim, the floor is yours. Great, thanks Josh. And uh, wow, it kind of sounds like a whirlwind of, <laughs> of my career there. And I apologize. I have a much shortened version. I am just essentially, uh, somebody who cares about others. I've, I've been in the helping professions for a long time, so I just want to help others, but I appreciate that introduction. Um, and I'm so happy that there are a lot of you, you know, with us this evening. I know we're here at the dinner time, so I appreciate you taking the time uh, to spend with us. I wanted to get a sense. So tonight's presentation is really more focused on uh, serious illness, and in particular, um, I'm going to focus more on you know the impact of a serious illness on both a patient and then family caregivers. So, if you don't mind, before I do the presentation, I wanted us to take just a little poll. I'm going to launch it here in a minute. Um, just doing a pulse check on everyone, getting a sense of in the past year, have you been um, someone, you know, a patient, perhaps she had a serious illness, um, or you were a family caregiver or a professional caregiver, or maybe you've been both. Um, so I'm just going to give uh, a couple of minutes here for folks to, to complete that. I'll just give it two more seconds. I'm going to go ahead. Okay. And I see Brenda's been more than one role. I should have added that. I'm going to end the poll and just sort of post our results. Um, good point, Brenda. I probably should have added multi instead of both multiple professional family caregiver um, care partner and certainly, you know, patient or survivor. So thank you. Thank you all for, um, indulging me a minute and just sort of getting a sense of, of where we're at. And as you can see, a lot of times we're wearing many hats for sure. We can be a patient and then a caregiver, um, all within, you know, sort of that same time frame. I am going to, Pull up my slides here. If I can just get a thumbs up, can we see them? 
great. Thank you. Thanks so much. I appreciate that. Um, so bear with me for a little bit of time. Uh, I do have some slides to show. And when I'm showing the slides, I may not be able to see everyone. And then we'll have an opportunity to kind of talk a little bit more about this or see what questions and that you may have. Um, hang on a second here. There we go. All right. So when either, you know, ourselves were faced with a, a serious illness or, you know, one of our loved ones, or perhaps we're in the professional space and we're helping others and, you know, it could be a diagnosis of cancer, congestive heart failure, kidney disease, Alzheimer's disease, you know, we can experience really a wide range of emotions and it could be anything from anxiety to depression, panic, uh, and even post-traumatic stress. So our lives can really be turned upside down when we get that diagnosis of a, of a serious illness or have a loved one that has that diagnosis. It's really a crisis point. And when that happens, I mean, we can really feel like that cow out in the ocean, um, sort of out of place and alone. And that's really a hard space to be in. And, and that's certainly for the person dealing with the illness, but then absolutely uh, the caregiver and the, and the family members can feel the same way as well. Um, there's a lot of experiences that we can certainly go through. I mean, this doesn't encompass certainly all of them, but these are really experiences that, that both the patient and the caregiver can um, go through. They can face perhaps at the same time, um, or more often than not, they may be facing these issues at different times. You know, if I'm a family caregiver, I may be more focused right now on, um, you know, some of those financial or work concerns. Uh, and if I'm the patient, I might be focused a little, you know, more on, you know, my health and, and how that is going. So some of those experiences, of course, are, you know, emotional and psychological distress feeling lost in the healthcare system. And I would say that's absolutely for both the, the patient and the family member. It's often very difficult to navigate um, healthcare system and health insurance and, and all of those aspects. Um, family caregivers can often feel that they're not equipped to take care of their loved ones. If we're a professional caregiver, you know, we've had that training and experience, you know, to help patients really manage their medical condition. But oftentimes we don't think about how really, really unprepared family caregivers are um, around whether it's, you know, medical care or even just the medical language that we use. And, you know, if you think of things like drain tubes and wound care and peg tubes and all those terms, medical terminologies that we use, that's all very different, um, you know, as a family caregiver. Both the patient and the family care, uh, caregiver can have physical um, poor physical health. So uh, many caregivers also have, you know, they're dealing with their own chronic illnesses as well. We oftentimes just think of the patient um, with the illness and, and, you know, the, the poor physical health that they may be in, but we oftentimes don't think about the family caregiver um, and how their health might not be in, in, in good shape. There's also certainly often social isolation when somebody is diagnosed with a serious illness, but I will say the pandemic has really um, increased, unfortunately, that social isolation. I mean, with 
COVID restrictions in hospitals at this point. Um, and I experienced that myself. My uh, mom through the pandemic had been hospitalized uh, three times during the course of the pandemic. The first time, um, the, you know, the COVID rates were not that high and they were still allowing like one patient visitor and I could go in and physically visit with her. But then the subsequent two times that she was hospitalized, I couldn't go in and visit her. And I just remember, um, you know, my mom telling me just that how lonely she felt in the hospital. I mean, she felt she had very, very good care um, from her care team within the hospital, but what an incredible lonely experience that was for her to be a patient in the hospital and not having the ability to see me or other family members. It was really, truly heartbreaking. And then, you know, there's certainly um, that fear of recurrence of the disease. Uh, very much can be top of mind for the patient, but cer certainly the caregiver. And then, of course, you know, there are work and financial concerns. Um, all of this, you know, when you think about all of this sort of happening and kind of coming all together with that diagnosis of, of a life-threatening or serious disease. I mean, that can lead immediately into shifts of roles within our family. So perhaps I was the family caregiver, but now I'm the patient. Um, and I've got to learn to allow others you know, to take care of me and to be accepting you know, of help from others, or I've got to rely on them, um, or a teen in the family may become a caregiver to a parent or a grandparent. So those dynamics really shift and how we once defined ourselves within the family uh, definitely can and, and does change. There are a lot of challenges, you know, that we can face and certainly not only with, with the patient, you know, some the person who's just diagnosed with the disease, but certainly all of, of the caregivers and the family um, surrounding them. And some of the more common changes or challenges, I would say, might be practical, for example, such as, you know, getting to medical appointments, you know, how am I going to get to my chemotherapy appointment when, you know, my wife is working, who's going to take me to that appointment, um, managing medications and just the variety of treatments, because that's all new. Um, there's physical challenges too right? Um, around sleep and being like very fatigued and um, maybe not having a proper diet. And then just, you know, managing um, one's physical conditions or perhaps physical decline um, due to the disease or perhaps, you know, treatments that somebody uh, is going through. Um, the other piece of the, the physical aspect, you know, challenges could be physically being able to um, find the time or feel like you um, can allow time um, to spend with family members or those enjoyable activities. And this physically, you may not feel like you're up to doing that. There, as we you know, I, I mentioned before, but there are some certainly social um, concerns that may involve um, a spouse or children or other family members and, and the medical team. And then emotionally, um, people can feel, you know, very alone and depressed, overwhelmed, um, these are all really common emotions, but, you know, they, they, they take a toll on both the patient and the family caregiver. And oftentimes faced with 
um, a serious illness, we might question our faith and spirituality. Uh, we may be disconnected from our faith community um, or really just face a, a loss or, or crisis of faith. Um, that crisis point in our life of, of having a life-threatening disease or a serious illness really impacts, you know, the decisions that that we may make. And, and all of these challenges really kind of impact or sort of lead to this decisional um, piece as well, because now we're um, faced with making some real decisions around our medical care, um, what type of treatment we're going to move forward with, what is our prognosis, um, we face decisions on whether or not we need to ask for help um, or accept that help. And certainly uh, we face decisions around end of life planning, um, having those discussions with our family members. Should we have those discussions? When do we have them? What are my thoughts around that? And advanced care planning. Um, so I included the slide. So this is the dude from the big Lebowski, but on, you know, I think this kind of says it all. That's, uh, that's a bummer, right? So all of that, what I just sort of talked about, you know, sort of what can happen when somebody's faced with, with a, um, serious diagnosis is that can sound, I mean, that sounds like really overwhelming. It sounds terrible and um, really just kind of a bummer. And although one would certainly have, and we would expect it's very normal to have, you know, difficult and even terrible moments um, within that course of a serious illness or that journey, whatever you want to call it, it doesn't define the person, the patient, the caregiver, um, or really even the experience. It's often these crisis points in our life, right? Um, such as facing a serious illness that makes us um, think about what's really important and we can experience some really positive outcomes from that. So we're certainly... Pro with the facing a uh, serious illness, you know, we start to reevaluate what's really important to us, such as maybe it's spending more time with our family. Uh, perhaps it's working less. Um, it may be slowing down and really enjoying things, life experiences that truly matter to us. And it can also mean that we finally decide to do those things that we've put off for years, right? So that vacation that we've been planning for years, we finally decide to take that. Maybe uh, we re-engage with our friends or family members that we've been estranged from. So oftentimes we may start to um, look at the connections, the relationships that we have and start to realize that there's a value in, in reconnecting um, with our friend or, you know, our cousin or other people within our family network. And then other more practical things that, that come out of that is, hey, maybe it's time to do a will or I think it's time I need to have an advanced directive. You know, my doctor told me I should really do an advanced directive. I'm thinking maybe I should do that this time. So we start to prioritize and, and have those discussions on how we want our medical care, how we want our end of life care to look like, and 
perhaps start to tackle some of those difficult discussions. Now, certainly not everybody <laughs> will do that, even though people are faced with a serious illness, they still put, put um, off the discussions around end of life or advanced care planning. And in fact, that's why you know, we continue to have these conversations, right? And uh, sessions around that and talk about how important it is. But anyway, these are all certainly positive aspects of, of a serious disease. So although um, as a patient, you might not have control over the disease progression, this is something we kind of talk about um, you know, in palliative care, you might not have control over that, how the disease progresses, but you do have control over other things. There's a lot of other things that you have control over, right? And I mentioned a few of those, you know, what I have control over, what my medical care is going to look like, or the choices I make around that. I have control over, um, what my end of life care might look like. Um, but then there are some very simple things um, that you would have control over. And it really starts with you. And I think first and foremost, um, you need to get in touch with your feelings and you need to share your feelings not only with your caregiver, but your loved ones, your family, but you also need to share your feelings with your medical care team. You know, if you're feeling sad or depressed um, or overwhelmed, I mean, there's certain aspects to having a serious illness where that's really normal um, to have those feelings of sadness or loss or depression. But um, there is a point in time where maybe you know, you sort of reach that tipping point and perhaps there's um, other help that you need to relieve that sense of, of sadness or depression that can really help manage that um, through your course of, of disease. The other thing, you know, I will say, and uh, I, I put it at the top is certainly as a patient, you do need to give yourself grace and compassion, just as you would give somebody else that grace and compassion, you know, we're most often hardest on ourselves. And we just need to take it easy um, on ourselves. And we may need to remind us. We have to remind ourselves that we have to provide that grace and, and compassion. Um, you know, I talked about share your feelings, but certainly play an active role in your care as much as you can. Um, you know, think about what, like I mentioned, what your medical care should look like or how you feel that should look like, but certainly um, other care, you know, your end of life care, you just need to be very active as much as you can in your own care. But that also means um, what care do you need? So being aware of the type of care that you could benefit from. Um, and accept help. <laughs> so think of uh, somebody giving you help as a gift, right? If I came to you and said, oh, Joan, I'm really happy to, um, I want to do some grocery shopping for you. I want to cook a meal. That's a gift. And you, trying to keep that in that frame and accept that gift, accept that help when you can. And on the same side, if, uh, and this gets back to communicating your feelings, if um, you, uh, if somebody isn't offering help, but you need help, communicating that you need help, letting people know that you need help. Believe me, people will help and explicitly telling people what you need or like. And then of course, assessing what's important to you and prioritizing those things. Um, you know, maybe it's no longer a priority for you to have the house cleaned, you know, be immaculate. It's okay. Let things go. Or maybe that's something you can delegate to others. And then again, I just end this with give yourself grace and, and compassion. 
Um, similar to patients, it's, it's kind of a similar playlist here <laughs> for caregivers. Um, you need to also get in touch with your own feelings and to give yourself grace and compassion um, and tell your feelings to your loved ones, um, family members, friends, other network. I know that can get um, a little dicey sometimes about how you might be feeling as a family caregiver. And this could come into play too. Well, certainly, you know, with professional caregivers, oftentimes you're not going to share your feelings with a patient that you're, you are helping with. But um, as a caregiver, there's a whole range of feelings you could be having. You could be overwhelmed. You could feel guilty. You could feel shame about you know, you're judging yourself on how well perhaps you're doing in that role as a caregiver. And so sometimes it's not the best thing to share those feelings um, with the patient, you know, the person who has the disease that you're helping with. Um, and in that case, sometimes it makes more sense to share those feelings with others within your network or confide, um, you know, seek out a professional counselor, you know, especially with feelings around guilt or, or um, being overwhelmed and, and maybe the changing roles or dynamics. Um, as much as you can, again, also play an active role in your loved one's medical care. I mean, that helps you to get a picture and sometimes, uh, well, oftentimes, two ears are better than one, especially when that medical jargon and information is being shared um, with your loved one. It's always good to um, have you in the room as well as much as possible. Um, we talked a bit about you know communicating, but certainly that rest and recharge. So as much as possible as a caregiver, you need to take care of yourself, um, have a healthy diet, get some physical activity and sleep is super important. Um, keeping that connection as much as possible to avoid that social isolation with some of your family members or friends, you know, even if it's just like a text message um, or a quick phone call, maybe a little note. Um, and, don't wait for others to reach out to you, reach out to them and just continue that connection because they too, um, your network can be the people that help you um, support as you're in your caregiver role. And then finally, as I said before, <laughs> you need to give yourself grace and compassion. It's just as important. Um, I share this slide here because you know kind of interesting <laughs> coping mechanism that's my survival kit it has a meditation tape aspirin and rose colored glasses sometimes we need to wear those rose colored glasses um and so i'll just mention some tips here for coping for for really both patients and caregivers and again, it's some of it is just really reiterating what I've said so far. And, and I may be, you know, kind of preaching to the choir and I hope I am to a certain degree. I hope folks are, you know, utilizing these um, coping mechanisms as already, but either way, patient caregiver, it's really important to talk about your feelings, no matter what they are. And, um, you know, just defining maybe where you might want to share those feelings, I think is helpful. Staying active and, and really eating balanced meals as much as you can is important. You need to stay nourished and, and healthy yourself. And try to enjoy things and treat yourself to things that you really enjoy. I mean, it can be simple things like a, a you know, taking a hot bath or a nap or enjoying your favorite foods and your favorite foods maybe aren't the balanced meals that you should be doing, but that's okay. You know, everything's is fine in, in moderation. Um, enjoying some of those activities like going to a movie and I would 
say, you know, maybe a funny movie. Um, I would tend to stay away from dramas. Uh, going out to dinner or perhaps, you know, going to a baseball game or a football game. Don't be afraid to get help with like those everyday jobs, like cooking and cleaning. I'm just going to tell you that so many people, um, I just love it when somebody asks me if, um, you know, I could do something for them. Um, and they're going through a rough time, whether they have an illness or something, I just want to be able to help somebody. And there are lots of people out there. So take advantage of that. And if help isn't offered, ask for it. Um, put yourself out there a bit and you would really be surprised at how many people will come and, and pitch in. Don't try to do it all yourself. Uh, again, that goes back to sort of prioritizing you know, there are certain things that maybe you have to do uh, yourself, um, like paying bills or something, but even that could possibly be delegated. But think about those things that could easily be delegated to, to somebody else. Um, the other thing too, you know, I get the whole rose colored glasses things, but also on the flip side, don't try to force yourself to be happy. Um, you are going to have, you know, days, whether you're a patient or a caregiver, it's like, wow, I just can't do it today. And that's okay. And that gets back to that giving yourself grace and compassion. Sometimes it's just exhausting to be happy for other people. Um, you don't need to do that all the time. And certainly don't try to do too much in one day. If your goal for the day is getting up, getting dressed, great. If your goal for the day is getting up, getting dressed or getting up, taking a shower and then getting dressed. Fantastic. Um, what you don't want to do is, you know, get up, get dressed. I'm going to go for that five mile walk that I always did because that may not happen. You know, that may be too much and you're just going to exhaust yourself. And then finally, I would just say, you know, don't give up those healthy habits that you might have. Um, if you were walking five miles a day <laughs> prior to a serious illness, and you can still physically do that, um, I would say do it. Um, if you know, you're a caregiver and that's what you did and you can find time to do that again, you know, maybe adjust the, the healthy habits to that, but don't completely give them up if at all possible. Um, there are, you know, there's quite a few resources out there and I put some of them in, in the slide here with the links and, and I know Ellen and Josh are going to um, share this information as well. I'm just going to call out a couple. Um, one is the American Cancer Society puts out a really great caregiver resource guide that you can either access online. It's an interactive guide. Um, or you can actually give us a call and um, get a hard copy of that um, caregiver resource guide. And then the other one I just wanted to call out is we actually um, have a whole caregiver video series that again is free. It's accessible on our website, which is cancer.org. Um, there's some great videos around caregiver self-care, you know, healthy eating, physical activity. But what's really also kind of interesting and might be useful and helpful to family caregivers is videos around physical care training, um, you know, really touching on specific areas around drain care, pain management, um, medications. And so I would encourage you, you know, if, if that is the space that you're in. There's some right, great videos around that. And then um, some videos around advocating for yourself and, and patients. So I actually, that pretty much ends my slides and I will stop sharing so I could see folks and just open it up to any questions.
So if you do have questions, you can you can either unmute yourself and, uh, and and address Kim directly, or otherwise you can put it in the chat for everyone to see. We do have mm -hmm. one right here, Kim. Uh, mm -hmm. So just uh, what tips do you have to provide hope and motivation to a loved one with a serious illness? Yeah, um, that's that's a good question, and sometimes that's tough because. Um, it's human nature, I think, to want to cheer somebody up and make them feel, feel good or feel better. You know, it's kind of uncomfortable to be in that space. Um, so first, I guess I would say that sometimes you just need to allow people to have that space of, of um, you know, being sad or, you know, kind of feeling down. But once you kind of get beyond that, um, I think for anyone, whether, you know, it's a loved one diagnosed with cancer or they have congestive heart failure or kidney disease or something like that, the disease doesn't define them. So I think having, talking about things other than, you know, the illness right at that time, like if they had a hobby they loved, you know, an interest, like they always loved to go fishing starting a conversation around um, fishing or, hey, remember the last time we went fishing together and we did this, this and that, that talking about things that, you know, maybe brings them joy um, helps to just kind of, you know, readjust or maybe reframe perhaps what they're thinking at that point. Maybe it's even, you know, planning, hey, what do you think about planning a uh, a fishing trip, you know, if they're really up to it, I, I think that's a good way. The other easy thing is humor. <laughs> if there's any way you can find any humor and I've done simple things as easy as, um, I was with somebody, we were in a store and I said, Hey, let's just check out these cards. And, um, we, so we were looking at you know, you can look at greeting cards and some of them are just really funny and silly. And we literally just sort of had a laughing session around silly cards, um, you know, movies, think jokes. If you're a good joke teller, I'm not, but you know, lots of people are. So I don't know, those are some tips to kind of help reframe it. Um, the path you don't want to go down, I would just say, around that is, you know, maybe telling them, oh yeah, everything's going to be okay. You're, you know, you're going to be fine. Um, because that can seem, you know, sort of disingenuous to folks that um, have a serious illness. Yeah. Right. It looks like we have one more and then we, and then we can wrap up. So mm -hmm. question is, how would you convince your family that you need help? Yeah. Yeah, good question. Um, like I mentioned, I mean, I, I know it's difficult for people, uh, especially if you're new to the role of, you know, having an illness um, or even, you know, from the side of a caregiver. So we could look at this from both perspectives, patient or caregiver, but um, it's oftentimes hard to ask for help, right? Um, so I think the best thing you can do, whether you're a patient or a caregiver, is just to be super clear about what you would like, um, what you need. It's not helpful to say something like, oh, I could really use your help around here. I mean, that's something I'd like say to my husband. Um, so don't say that because then that's just a, makes people defensive. But if you said something like, um, gosh, I'm really feeling tired today and um, I could really use your help in making dinner um, today or it could be tomorrow or whatever, or bringing or picking up dinner. That would just be really helpful to me. Um, and then at the same token, when somebody does something for you, you, it's great to use I statements like, you know, I really feel so much better like when you rake the yard for me, because then I didn't have to think about doing that. Um, so that's just, you know, kind of a way to um, address that. But I think the bottom line is just be as clear and concise as to what you want or need. 
Awesome. Well, with that, yeah. Kim, I want to say thank you so much. I know everybody here is really grateful that you were able to spend some time with us today and share all this important uh, information. So for Kim, for more access and uh, for Kim's bio and information and whatnot with her and the, and the slides mm -hmm. that she just presented, they will be on our website tonight. So you will have access to that, everybody. Um, if you've missed previous previous sessions from yesterday with Dr. Jessica of Theta Care or Monday with Ben Adams of McCarty Law, they are also on our website, they'll be on our Facebook page and they're on our YouTube page as well. Um, for more, more information on all of our speakers, other events, monthly classes and more, you can go to our website at www.feacpp.org or our Facebook page at Let's Talk Fox Valley. And also be sure again, so to check your email for that post-op survey tonight. So if you keep entering and you let us know how we're doing mm -hmm. and whatnot in terms of running the event, you will enter to win a $50 Blue Moon Emporium gift, gift card in Appleton. So thank you again to Kim and thank you everyone for showing up and hopefully see you tomorrow at 5 p.m. for Kimberly Paul for our fourth and final event. Great. Thanks everyone. And thank you, Kim. Bye.